Hello, and welcome to the LexisNexis webinar on the ETCC protocol. Whilst use of the e-disclosure protocol is not mandatory, if parties do not use it and do not have an alternative suitable way of dealing with electronic disclosure, the court is likely to order the parties to use the protocol. So I think the point is that the protocol is not mandatory, but if the parties don't have an alternative document on which they can record their areas of agreement and disagreement on electronic disclosure, then the court will order them to use the TCC e-disclosure protocol. So, so let's actually go through it and bring in the rest of our panel as to what's happening here. Um, I, I, I'd first like to all sort of talk through the first stage of that EDRM model as far as the TCC protocol is concerned, is collecting the data. Uh, and and so I'm going to come to you first to sort of w what issues do you have you encountered when you sort of actually uh, collection what, what what's been the problems in those collection areas I think one of the uh, one of the major issues that we've encountered uh, in sort of when doing the collection mm -hmm. of data is that um, the client will usually be um, quite uh, reserved and doesn't want a uh, disruption to basically um, to his offices, and so wouldn't really allow us to um, engage external suppliers or even our own internal forensic team to go and basically collect the data. So they wish that you know they decide to do it themselves. They think it's cheaper. They think it's easier. Mm. What actually happens is that one, you've got problems with how the data is collected. And I think we'll come to to that later. But also, you end up um, being given a set of data that doesn't actually. Uh, there isn't a full set of data, it's not actually everything that you need and so mm. you end up in situations where you have to go back and collect for you know further sets of data and further inboxes mm. and it's just all a bit of a nightmare and it becomes really expensive. The key really is collection is actually probably the most important part of the, the disclosure exercise. If you get the right data in the beginning everything else becomes much easier and I, and I guess the difficulty is initially with managing the client and explaining to them, for, for those that don't understand or haven't done one of these before, the importance of having somebody come in who's got the expertise to, to collect the data rather than relying on people within the client organisation to you know, search in boxes with, with search terms and sort of give you this incomplete amount of data that you then have to run searches on. People ask questions later and you find out actually something's missing it's just far easier for everybody involved and actually more cost effective in the long run if you, if you do it properly up front. In the protocol itself there is just one sort of paragraph that, that, that's quite sort of key on how you approach what you do the review and analysis and Sarah can you just sort of take us through is it uh, section 5.1a? This is what the protocol um, states. It says it's agreed that after application of processing and reduction the categories of documents listed in appendix 5 um, for example, by reference to custodian, date ranges, or type, A, need not be reviewed before disclosure is given to the other party or parties, or B, will, to the extent agreed, be reviewed before disclosure is given to the other party to ensure that documents do in fact fall within the scope of disclosure agreed in paragraph, the paragraph 3.4 above. Yeah, so again, in non-legal terms, we're saying after we've done all our processing, we might choose to hand it over without looking at it anymore. And before the lawyers either side of me faint, we actually <laughs> discuss that. Uh, but the option is there to use it. Or even though it's been through all this clever technology, we are still going to look at it to make sure whether or not it actually is relevant or it might be relevant, but we're not going to rely on court or the issues or whatever. And so therefore we, we won't hand it over. Mm. I think those are those your two options. When we were drafting the protocol, there was, um, there was a concern and it, it was something that I raised actually because I had just been called into a disclosure exercise which was near completion um, in my law firm to have a look at it because there had been confusion at the outset when they were discussing um, the approach to disclosure with the other side and they had assumed that what they had agreed was that they would get the documents, process them, apply keyword searches and then that would be it. And, and, and I stepped in and said, well no, that can't be it, you must, there must be more to do because obviously you've got to get the privileged material out, mm. you've got to get anything confidential out. So you can't just simply hand over those documents having applied the keywords. And so there was a concern when we were in the committee drafting this protocol that there is a degree of confusion sometimes mm. amongst parties as to if you agree with the other side and say, well, um, you know, these are the keywords we're going to use and you spend a lot of time discussing keywords 
sometimes parties can assume that that's all you're going to do to the documents and you're going to hand it over right. and but you're not you're actually doing other things in the Absolutely. background but they may yeah. not yeah. be aware of it and have assumed that that's all you're doing so we put that in on purpose to make people realize that there's a difference between agreeing keywords and handing over the documents well, so I mean we once talking about prev and prev logs um, there's again, Mary Clarkey, just there's, there's a thing called well, a clawback. Yes. What's, what's clawback and why has <laughs> that got a little bit more weight in the pro Why do we advise in the protocol it should have a little bit more weight and how do you give it that weight? Um, okay, well, we thought about clawback as something that I've used for quite a few years actually because um, with the volumes of data going up and up and up on electronic disclosure and the pressure on cost and time. It's that old triangle between cost, time and quality, something yeah. always gives. Mm. And there's always an issue, there's always the possibility that something may get through. So if you disclose a million documents and there's a 1% error rate, I mean, what's that, a thousand documents have got through? Maybe out of those thousand, 999 will be irrelevant, it doesn't matter, but there could be one that's privileged and um, quite possibly more. So there's that recognition that with electronic disclosure and volumes going up and using computer assisted review and other techniques, and indeed just using teams of paralegals where the quality yeah, may not really always be absolutely. amazing, um, that you need to have some sort of safety net. And that was where we come up with the idea of a clawback, which has been used in the United States for quite a number of years. I mean, I think there's a practical difficulty with the clawback as well in that, I mean, if you disclose an email and somebody has to read it to realize that it is yes. privileged. Yeah. You can't unread yeah, yeah. the document. You can send it back yeah. or bring it to their attention as you should, but, yeah. but you know, the, yes, the cat's out the back. I, I would like to, because we're going to go through and, and, and talk about this, the, 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 the overall principle, of course, we are talking about a litigation process and, and you know, litigation lawyers are bred from birth to argue about everything. The analogy I'm using at the moment, the thing about the protocol, it doesn't mean that you don't argue. It's just basically you agreed the boxing ring. You, you've yeah. got it there, you, you don't have to argue about what the specification of the boxing wing, you still step inside that and take the blows at each other and you can have some very good, I think you've had some incredibly good arguments within the boundary of the protocol. Right? It does not stop you from, <laughs> from, from having an argument. We're going to look at the custodians now, so the location and na nature of documents. Uh, and is ever the way, I, think that, I don't think there's anything to do with the TCC protocol, but custodians are always something that people argue about an awful lot. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. it's, uh, it's always, yeah. uh, I think, one of the most heated areas. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the key uh, battleground, I would Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, especially because, well you've, got your well, you've got your client on one side who doesn't want certain custodians to be included mm. because it might be you know, people higher up the chain yeah. or mm. people who don't want to hand over their inboxes. But then you've also got the other side who are definitely want to get you know are yeah. definitely trying to keep some people yeah. out of the list. So yeah, always big big I, I find debates. The senior and then, then the other sort of big uh, argument is about actual document location, which, which sounds um, is a, a bit of a misnomer because it, what, what we do in the protocol, we, we we bang on quite a bit about something called a data map. Uh, which is what we advise is that the lawyers sit down with the techie uh, and with the, the in-house counsel and the in-house IT team and in their own mind have an idea of where the information that's relevant to this case is. Mm. So it, it, it's, it is not a splendid diagram of the client's IT infrastructure with servers and things like that. It, it, it's more a picture or a set of words or one of those bubble diagrams that you can look at and understand where the information is. Then when you get to the protocol and you get to the document location, that's where you articulate where you're getting your information from. Yeah. And yeah, if you don't have in-house, again, one of the things in the protocol we go on and on about, it's not just the sales thing, it's involve an external supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. From a very early stage, mm -hmm. even at yeah. the point when you first go and talk to the client, most suppliers will gradually, free of charge, send someone along mm -hmm. with you for those first initial interviews because they want to be able to help you yeah. Yeah. and do a very, you know, they are, they are a partner, they're not a vendor, they don't sell you bottles of coke, mm. you know, they are an easy slope, but treat them like you would treat an expert. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm. And I think mm -hmm. it, as long as you give them clear instructions and you have a, a basic understanding of what it is they're doing, you can control costs and you can explain that to the client. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, go off and spend thousands and thousands of pounds without any mm. input, but I mean, obviously if you let people just get on with what they're doing and you don't keep any sort of control over the process, yeah. then it, it does have that danger as any 
sort of expert or other third party that you involve does. So, so yeah, I think people get quite worried about this, that if it's if you underestimate it at the beginning and it turns out to be a higher figure, you're not going to be allowed it. But I don't think that is what the court's saying. As long as you've done all you reasonably could have done at that early stage, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. very difficult to be criticised later, as long as you've got the assumptions in there mm -hmm. and things have you know, legitimately yeah. changed. What I find quite um, interesting and a little bit funny, actually, is that a lot of people um, misunderstand hard copy disclosure. So I had a, a case, so, uh, or my team did, um, where there was two different types of disclosure approaches, so one for electronic and one for hard copy. Um, but quite a few of the parties had chosen to scan and OCR the hard copies and yet treated them like they were hard copy documents yeah. still, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. even though they had actually been converted into electronic exactly. formats. It's one of the yeah. things, I think, the guidance notes, we did a lot of work yes. on that. Uh, I remember writing quite a few, set, trying to spell out that yes, once it, something's been turned into an electronic document, yeah. it is electronic just because it started life as paper, as opposed to you know the printout from a cab machine, or mm -hmm. you know, the, the stays as paper, keeps as paper all the way through. Yes. And that if if it's electronic, you treat it electronically, not yeah. some. Ma oh, yeah. But that was a paper document, therefore I'm going to do it as exactly. A bit of paper. Okay, so moving on for documents, I'm going to go to the favourite topic of lawyers: keywords, <laughs> keywords, keywords. My my my, my, my one story on keywords is that I, I I'm an independent consultant. I had a phone call from a lawyer and saying, Andrew, can you help me? Can you advise me? Give me the names of three suppliers so I can get my, my quote to get my, my e-disclosure system. Because I've just agreed the keywords with the other side, now I need to go and collect the data. At uh, which point my heart sank and I thought, the, the people I'm going to send you on to are not going to thank me for this one, but, but yeah. Why is that wrong, you know, James? Well, I think you're probably putting the... Um you know, doing it the wrong way around really, you should wait and get the um, third party provider involved before you start agreeing the keyword searches because they are so important to getting the, um, the right documents returned for you then to review. If you're trying to, to restrict the amount of documents you're actually eventually having to review, you want to make those as tight as possible and I think that's important to involve the And, and in the protocol, we, we, are, we are out of time, we're out of time, so I, I, I've got a couple of... Uh, housekeeping notes as it were but first of all can I say thank you very much to my panel for what's thank been you. a thank fascinating uh, and hopefully quite a, a, a healthy lively debate uh, this has been us that's been you thank you very much <laughs>